prophecy and we're studying Daniel Revelation end time prophecies this whole series and um, I'm excited I don't have to rush through it but as we go through it I pray that you're blessed by the study from week to week because I've been I know I've been blessed so far now today's title study number two apostasy leads to captivity apostasy leads to captivity just a little review what is bible prophecy what is bible prophecy is what's the p word is another p word what is it prediction that's basically what it is it's prediction before it happens it's history in advance god tells us before it happens why Amos 3 7 surely the Lord God will do what nothing but he revealeth his secrets unto his prophets and to his servants the prophets so where I need to go if I want to know what God's secrets are that he revealeth because it's not a, it's not a secret for those who are going to the prophets of Daniel Revelation Jeremiah Isaiah those who are going to the prophets they see what God has revealed but those who don't go it's still a secret <laughs> So if we're not studying, that's why we need to study in these last days. But God said, I'll reveal it. And we know that prophecy is about who? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's Revelation 1.1. It's all about Jesus. It all centers on Jesus. Prophecy reveals what Jesus has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Amen? So isn't that something God tells us his plan? And then he also lets us know what Satan is doing in the background so we won't get caught up. He lets us know that Satan is trying to turn the direction signs. Now, wouldn't it be something if... if you know, remember back in the day, we didn't depend on GPS. We had to map it out. We depend on signs. And we wrote it down. Somebody told us what sign, what, what direction to go, and what signs to take. And then you get to that point. What if the sign is telling you you're supposed to go to the left, but the time, they turn the sign to go to the right? And you get there and don't know it. See, what God does, he reveals it before it happens. So somebody changed the sign. Somebody changed things. You need to see that. So you can stay on that narrow road. So God tells us what's going to happen. He tells us what's, what he's done in the past, what he's doing now, and what he will do in the future. And Jesus gave us a promise that what? He will come again. I believe that promise. Do you believe that promise? Do you believe this book right here? If you believe this book, that's why we got to study it like we never before. Because some people have this philosophy out there today that God's redemption is flexible. They're teaching that from the pulpit, that God has flexible redemption. <laughs> flexible redemption? That don't make any sense. If God has, Jesus has flexible redemption, why would somebody come and die on a cross for you and I? That makes no sense. Why would somebody go through the pain and agony and drop in his blood for you and I? If it's flexible, he just said, well, let's just do over. <laughs> it's not flexible. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. You have to remember as we go through the book of Daniel, and you're going to see that this is, this is going to be one of the most powerful journeys that we're going to go through. This end time prophetic book in the Old Testament, Daniel. It takes us to the end of time. It's a book that all of God's remnant people must know and understand for yourself for the last days. You've got to know it. And I told you that one of the best secrets, not really a secret, but the best way to understand and comprehend is to teach it somebody else. You set things up to teach it, even if you had a small Bible study group or, or at home or a one-on-one -on -one with a, a friend or a neighbor. You set things up and they say, yeah, I want a Bible study. Yeah, yeah, I need you. I'm telling you, then things you retain it better. And then it gives you more account accountability to study it deeper doesn't it? It does. Because if you know, if you're just studying for yourself, sometimes we just kind of go surface study. But when you know you gotta, you're got sharing with somebody else, you got to go deeper because you may have questions. <laughs> and you want to make sure you can answer them the best you can. So let's go on this journey. Now remember, Daniel is, has how many chapters? Twelve chapters. And remember again, it is split in the half. Happy Sabbath. It is split in the half. And it's basically two books in one, volume one and volume two. The first six chapters gives us the, reveals the characters. It gives us stories that we need to understand. The characters must, must develop to make it through the end of time. All right? But it also gives us, in Daniel chapter 2, it gives us prophecy. But that first half of the book, is gives, it reveals the characters we need to make it to the end of time and make it to the kingdom of God. Now, the second half, 
is chapter 7 through 12. There are prophecies built from the, there, there are prophecies built from Daniel chapter 2 that takes us to the end of time, that, that takes us to the everlasting kingdom. You got that? So Daniel chapters 1 through 6, character development, what we need to make it through. Daniel chapter 7 through 12 are Bible prophecies built on the foundation of Daniel chapter 2. And it repeats and enlarges itself, repeats and enlarges. All right, we got it. That's a teaching method that it uses, a repeat and enlarge. So let's again, again talk about today. Extremely important study. And one thing is I, I like this format because I don't have to rush through it. I don't have like two weeks and I got to rush. Through. I like this format because I can take two, chap- two verses of Daniel and we can just break it down a day. That's it. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not rushing through Daniel chapter 1. Because sometimes we miss some things. And this is a key thing we understand. Apostasy leads to what, everybody? Captivity. It leads to captivity. In today's study, we will look at the circumstances and events that sets the stage of the book of Daniel. You got to understand this part. In other words, why is it that they are going into captivity? Why is God's people going into captivity? And then we're going to learn lessons that teach us to live at how we need to live to make it to the end of time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Jamie. Amen. What are the circumstances and events that introduce to the book of Daniel? All right, so again, you want to get your Bibles because like I said, I got a lot of t- t- scriptures to go through if you don't have a Bible. Everybody got one? Here's an, extra, here's an extra one. You can pass it back. There's one over there. Let's go to Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And this again, this is the, um, the beginning of our study in the book of Daniel. Now, what are the circumstances and events that introduces the book of Daniel? Starting with verse 1, and it says, In the third year, very important, in the third year of the reign of who? Who is, who is the king? Jehoiakim of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon into Jerusalem and besieged it. Besieged meaning captured it. It attacked the people and took some people and then took some stuff. But who was the king of Judah? Jehoiakim. Now, the king of Judah are supposed to be the people of Judah who has the law and the testimonies. They're supposed to be the God's people. But now we see a, a, a pagan nation, a heathen nation, Coming to take God's people. Why? Took the king. This is, let's look at in verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Okay. What part and with part of the vessel of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his gods, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his gods. So we see clearly that Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan worshiper who worship the false gods. We see that Babylon is a pagan empire. So these first two verses sets the stage. It reveals that Babylon under the king Nebuchadnezzar he attacks the city of Jerusalem. He takes the king of Jerusalem, who is Jehoiakim at that time, and Jehoiakim is taken captive with some others, take them captive. And at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar goes into the temple and take some vessels now notice at this point he doesn't decimate the whole place of judah but i want you to notice some things and i want you to notice that at this time babylon is on the rise this is the beginning of their empire the growing of their empire and one of the areas they wanted to take of course was that whole area of israel they already start to work on the assyrians and then they're going to take over the whole part of israel that's what they were doing. So they were, they were a growing superpower at the time. Now, Babylon, we look at this map here. Babylon is actually located in Iraq. That's what today what we call Iraq. And it's right here. And it's interesting because Babylon is still a decimated city today. But you can see this is the Middle East here, so you can kind of get some, some cognitions of what we're talking about. Here's Iraq here, and there's Babylon in Iraq. That's where it's located. And then you see here is Israel. That's where Israel is located. 
All right, now we do know that Babylon means, in the Hebrew, Babylon is also known as Babel, which means confusion by mixing. Confusion by mixing. And many of us know the story of the Tower of Babel. Remember that in Genesis? After the worldwide flood and um, the people, as the, as, the, as the world began to repopulate again, the people united together to rebel against God and built a Tower of Babel, saying he would never destroy us again. He would never destroy us. Start to build. So if he have a flood, we're going to build it big enough <laughs> so it wouldn't take us down. <laughs> that was a crazy thinking. But anyway, but God spread the people out, scattered them. What did he do? What did he cause, what did he cause to happen? As they were building this tower, they couldn't even finish it. Why? Because he confused their languages. That's how we got our languages today. This person said, pass me the hammer. And he's like, you know, speaking in another tongue. He kids, what did you say, man? I told you to want you all. Like, what are you talking like that for? And, and, and we know the story. So people began to scatter throughout the earth. So they could not feel, finish the, the um, power of Babel. But, again, Babylon means confusion by mixing. That's the same area of Babylon that King Nebuchadnezzar was growing as an empire. All right? Many years later. Now, main questions today, it was very important that we understand this because, again, we need to understand the circumstances of why. Why did the Lord give Jehoiakim the king of Judah? That is God, that's supposed to be God's people, right? Why is he put in placing in the hand of Babylon? Why is it God's people in the hand of Judah in the hands of Babylon? And in other things, what are the implications and lessons that we must learn from this? So we're going to be learning a lot of stuff as we go through the process of answering this main question today. Why? This is the context of Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look. We're going to find. Let's go through, let's go through the process. Y'all ready? Because you're right. Let's go through the process. Now, what explicit instruction and words of encouragement did Daniel give to the ch- Moses, sorry, what encouragement did Moses give to the children of Israel before they possessed the land of the promise? Now, remember that God gave his people the promise from Abraham. He said, oh, I'll bless your nations. He gave them an everlasting covenant in which they will not only bless Abraham and his seed, but those throughout the whole world. He gave them both the law and the testimonies, a full knowledge of the truth of who God is. He gave, he blessed Abraham with that for his children to continue it on. And his children, that's the people of Israel, Jacob. And his name was changed from Jacob to what? Israel. And all that followed him, all his children were supposed to do the same work that God gave to Abraham. To be a blessing to the world, to give them the law and the testimony, to know, to let the world know who the creator is. So can all remember who God is. That was their duty. That was their command. To let everybody know the full knowledge of God's truth, to know about salvation. So God gave Moses to give to the people. Remember, (laughs) God's people were in bondage, right, for about 400 years, right, 400 years in Egypt because of disobedience. God was teaching them a lesson, but he said, I'm come to redeem you from Egypt. Now, if you were in 400 years of, of, of bondage, your people, 400 years of bondage, wouldn't you be appreciative of what God has done, taking you out of bondage? That's right. You may be ignorant because if you don't remember, we become ignorant. That's the problem. That's why God says, don't forget. But let's look at this. Let's go through this. Deuteronomy. So keep your finger in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 5, and 17. Again, I encourage you to read the whole chapters because I can't give you the whole chapter. So just note these texts, but I'm just going to give you pieces so you can understand the instructions that God has given us so we can understand why a posse leads to captivity. God is not flexible. God is changes not. But we need to change. Amen. Does God need to change? No, we need to change. He's a creator, God. Can we make something out of nothing? No, only God can. He has proven himself to us time and time again. It's a privilege for us to live. Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 17. And thou shall love. This is what this is what Moses is telling the people. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Skip to verse 17. Ye shall, what, diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies which ye have commanded thee. And just like we sung earlier today, if you trust and obey, 
there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Amen. So God's revealing here as we continue to read on. If you want to be happy, if you want to have peace in your life, trust and obey. Amen. Follow the commandments of God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Who gives you power to follow the commandments of God? Jesus Christ. Now let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, next chapter. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6, 9, and 12. So we're just going to skip around. So what's, what does Moses say in Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is a repeating of the law. That's what Deuteronomy means, the repeat of the law. So he's repeating and letting the people, the children know, before they go into the Canaan land, don't forget. That's what he's telling them. Don't, don't what? Don't forget what God has done for you. Even though Moses was not going into, he was able to go into the promised land because we know what he did. He just, he, he made a major mistake, but he was repentant of it when he struck the rock, when he was supposed to speak to the rock. But he wanted the people to remember the law of God. Don't forget it. And this is what he says. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, where thou goest to possess it, and cast it out in many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Jezreelites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the, Hivites, the Jebusites, Seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, utterly destroy them. Thou shalt not make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Now, don't forget, what's he telling them to do? He's now giving them the land of promise, the land of promise that was given to Abraham. Abraham, when he was here, on the, when he was on the earth, sojourning Canaan land, he did not receive the promise until years later his children received the promise. Now, remember, Abraham, what was his purpose in the land of Canaan? To be a blessing to the nations. He was, his main purpose was to give the light of truth who God is to a heathen nation. In other words, God pleaded with all those nations at the time of Abraham, but they eventually rejected it, and then God placed his sentence upon those nations. He says, your sentence is death. That's basically it. And then I'm going to use the children of Israel to get rid of them. And he commanded them to utterly destroy them. And he told them, a little bit at a time, you are destroyed all the nations. And he continues on. Not only did not destroy them, verse 2, thou shalt make no covenant with them and show mercy unto them. Verse 3, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, and daughter shall thou take unto thy son. Is that pretty clear? I want you to see how clear God is. Verse 4, for they shall turn. Why don't you do this? For they shall what? Turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So, Will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly? That's our problem. Sometimes we forget these things. God has told us clearly, I'm God. I'm telling you, if you do that, if you make a league with them, marrying their sons and their daughters, it's going to turn you away from me. You're going to forget me. And he said in verse 5, but thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy what you need to do. Well, they're pagan worshipers. they idol worshipers. Destroy their idols. Break Destroy the altars, break down the images, cut down their groves, burn their grave and images with what? Fire. Why? For thou art a holy people unto who? The Lord thy God. God does not share his glory with any false imaginations of people. That's, and that, that's what false gods is, is imagination of men, of corrupted hearts, because they're not real. He said, I don't share my glory with that. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a what? Special people to himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is who? He is God. The faithful God, which keepeth the covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God says, I will not break the covenant. I am God, I change not. I am not slack on my promises. I said it, it's going to be done. I'm giving you this covenant of blessing. It's yours, but you got to do your part. You got to keep it. Amen. Verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments and keep them and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep thee, the covenant and mercy which ye swear unto the fathers. Let's go now. Let's go to verse chapter eleven. Let's look at some more of these things. What God has said is a promise. This is a promise. For if ye shall diligently keep these commandments which I command you, 
and do them to love the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and cleave unto him. What's he saying? Verse 23. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations, mightier than than themselves, than yourself. The Lord made it very clear. I didn't choose you because you're a mighty nation. It's not because you're a mighty nation. You're going you're gonna to take over mighty nations. You're going to be small compared to what they are, and you're going to be mightier than they. Verse, let's continue. Let's go to, back to chapter 8. Let's skip to chapter 8, 11, 19, and 20. Again, I, I, I encourage you to read these things. It's powerful stuff. He says right here, verse 11, beware, thou forget not, what's he say? Beware, thou forget not the Lord thy God, and not keeping his commandments, his judgment, his statutes, which I command thee this day. And it shall be, if thou would, and it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God. Now this is very clear. And walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them. I testify against you this day, that ye shall what? Surely perish. That's the reason why the sentence of, of Canaan land was given unto them, because they rejected the truth. They rejected the law and the testimony. They were surely to perish. God says, even though I have chosen you to be my people, but if you reject it, you will surely perish too. That's what he's revealing to them. Verse 20, as the nations which the Lord destroyeth before thy faith, ye, sh ye shall perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord thy, your God. See, that God is just revealing his justice. That's all he's doing. But remember there, before there, before justice, there's what? Mercy. He's given them the mercy, but they reject the mercy. The ultimate consequences is you're going to receive the punishment. Let's look at now. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28, 32, 41, 45, 52, 64. <laughs> Let's look at this now because we're looking at the question, why is Babylon in captivity? Did God reveal to them the conditions? This is actually a conditional prophecy, this covenant, just to let you know what your future is, if you keep it or if you disobey it. Verse 32, thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and, there shall not, and they shall be no might in thine hand. In the context, if, if they reject the law, God's revealing that his, his, the sons and daughters will become somebody else's people. Now, verse 41. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into what? Captivity. If they reject the law and the testimonies, reject that covenant. That's what he's telling them. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hast hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, and he commanded thee. Verse 46, and they shall be upon thee for a sign, for a wonder upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness, with gladness of heart, and for an abundance of all things. Therefore shall thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. He shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until, ha until he have destroyed thee. Do you need to break that down? Is God pretty clear to his people? The Lord shall bring a nation against thee far, from far, from the end of the earth, as a swift as eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Uh, the, the, he, the children of Israel did not understand Chaldee. Chaldee was a language of Babylon. <laughs> a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the persons of old, nor shall favor to the young, and he shall eat the fruit of thy, of thy cattle, the fruit of thy land, until they be destroyed, which also shall not leave neither corn nor wine nor oil, nor increase of thy kind, nor flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee, verse 52, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates un, until, all thy high and, until thy high and fenced walls come down, therein thou trusteth throughout all thy land and he shall besiege thee and all thy gates throughout all thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and then verse 64 
and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth unto even unto another, and thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Now is that pretty clear. This is before they went into the Canaan land. Moses made it clear to the people hundred years before we get to Daniel and find out Jehoiakim and the God's people are, are in bondage. That's right. That's right. Babylon and Daniel 7 had eagle's wings as, as, the, as it mentioned here in this text. That's, that's good. That's good. They, they swiftly flew over to capture those in Judah. But let's continue on. So we see this is a covenant contract, a promise. It's a conditional prophecy. And the promises, it promises blessings if this contract is kept. Amen. But at the same time, let you know you're on your own. That's what God is saying. You're on your own. See, you're playing with, when we reject God, you, now we're on Satan's territory. And what is Satan's territory? What does Satan want to do? Kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he want to do. So he's saying, now you're on your own. Now, now you, you think you all, you think you depending on your fence cities, please. Come on understand it was me that was protecting you all along but now you're going to push it away now one of the curses out of many is if they reject God's truth we just read what will happen to them they will go into what captivity that's what God said that's what God said he said if you reject this truth if you break this covenant you will go into captivity has God's word changed will it still happen today see we will go in that captivity under the, under the bondage of Satan when we reject the truth we're in a bondage of sin so it's still, it's still the same for so if I'm going in apostasy of rebellion I'm going to go into that captivity but God wants to avoid all that for all of us that's why he's given it to he told the children of Israel this what happened to the children of Israel after the death of Joshua and the elders who knew him? Now, we all know the story. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. We know the story when he, when he actually went into the Canaan land and the Lord miraculously uh, won uh, Jericho and then many other places. We know that story, right? We all understand that. And Joshua did some mighty things and they were able to take over, take over property and land as God told them to do. And we know about Joshua even before that he had a much faith. He took Moses' position. But what happened after he died? He held back the idol worship. What happened after he died?